Ани говорит и показывает Бодифиус. One of the goals of the Conan role-playing game is to create an experience that's as close as possible to the original spirit of author Robert E. Howard, who created Conan. So for more, I'm joined by Jeffrey Shanks, and he's in Tallahassee, Florida. He is the technical advisor, among other things, on the Conan RPG project. Um, Jeffrey, tell us a little bit about, real quick, your role in the project. Well, I'm a, um, a Robert E. Howard expert. I'm an expert on Howard and the Conan stories. And so I was brought on board uh, basically to help ensure that the game stays uh, true to the source material. So I'm kind of a subject matter expert. Um, I've also been helping out with the uh, art direction, uh, of, you know, making sure that the art also uh, stays true to the, the spirit of the original Robert E. Howard. Kind of and you have an academic background, among other things, is that right? I'm an archaeologist, professional archaeologist. I've, I've been in uh, academia. I currently work uh, for the National Park Service. But I also do a lot of academic work uh, on the side in popular culture studies. And so I, uh, um, I've done a lot of work on uh, pulp magazines, early comic history, that sort of thing, and on Robert E. Howard and, and Conan. So I guess it, to, sort of set the, to sort of set the context for, all, for the game, um, can you tell us a little bit about Robert E. Howard and, you know, how he got writing and maybe an introduction to him and Conan? Well, sure. Robert E. Howard was a, uh, a Texas pulp writer. Um, he was active during the 1920s and 30s, sort of the heyday of, of uh, pulp fiction. Uh, he wrote primarily for the magazine Weird Tale. Um, he was a contemporary of people like H.P. Lovecraft, Clark Ashton Smith, Robert Block, some of the other... Uh, uh, early weird fiction writers that wrote for Weird Tales. Uh, he corresponded with Lovecraft, and they often collaborated on those stories. And uh, he was a um, let's see, he was uh, he also wrote in a number of other genres, though westerns, uh, pirate fiction, um, uh, even detective fiction. He tried that, tried his hand at that. Uh, crusade stories. So he dabbled in a lot of genre fiction, but. Uh, he's known primarily as the father of sword and sorcery, uh, or what we call sword and sorcery today, the subgenre of fantasy. And uh, that's, that's sort of his, uh, you know, his claim to fame. And, of course, the Conan stories are the ultimate sword and sorcery uh, you know, foundation series, essentially, sort of the Ur sword and sorcery series. So... You know, I, I mentioned that uh, you know Howard uh, dabbled in a lot of different genres. You actually see that a lot in the Conan stories. They aren't always just straight fantasy stories. A lot of times, they are uh, other genre, pulp genre stories, like a western. They have sort of western tropes, but set in a fantastic environment with supernatural threats and menaces. Uh, they might be a pirate type story, you know, but set in a fantastic setting. Um, they might be a crusade story, you know, but you add in a Lovecraftian monster and it becomes sword and sorcery. And so Howard was playing a lot with, you know, mixing different genre tropes uh, into these stories. And that's a lot of what we're trying to capture with the game as well. We want to get that feel of a lot of different pulp genres, um, action, adventure, you know, lost cities in the jungle and uh, pirates and swashbuckling tales, you know, tales of thievery and uh, adventure and treasure, treasure hunting, all of these sorts of things. These were really popular uh, pulp tropes in the 20s and 30s. And you know, a lot of uh, our genre fiction today has its roots there. And so we're trying to get back to that with this game, uh, get back to those original pulp roots in Robert E. Howard's Conan stories from the, from the 1930s. Okay, and how do they differ in sort of tone from maybe what people are are more familiar with like the films or maybe some of the later writings. I understand there was a difference between the writings after his death and, and while he was alive. Sure. You know, um, you know, after his death, he died in, in 1936. Um, you know, after his death, the, um, the stories were kind of dormant for a while, but they came back in the 1950s and really in the 1960s uh, with the paperbacks, with the Frank Frazetta covers. And that uh, really brought uh, Howard's Conan stories back into popular culture. Um, right after that was the Marvel uh, series, you know, with uh, art by Barry Windsor Smith and John Buscema, uh, written by Roy Thomas in the 1970s. Hugely popular comic series. 
you know, at one point in the 1970s, Conan was selling as well as Spider-Man and Hulk. And that led to, uh, that popularity led to the Conan movie with Arnold Schwarzenegger that a lot of people are familiar with. Um, so, you know, there's this pop culture version of Conan, you know, that you know, sort of developed in the, in the, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Um, that's, it is a little bit different than the original version. A lot of these later uh, versions of the character, they're coming after people have discovered the Lord of the Rings, for example, and Tolkien after Dungeons and Dragons uh, had come out there. And so, you know, they tended to be, have a little bit more of a high fantasy feel, like a Tolkien or like Dungeons and Dragons, some of these later versions of Conan. Um, you know, you'll, you'll see him fighting a dragon or things like this, tropes that you find in typical uh, high fantasy, you know, standard fantasy. And that's really not what Sword and Sorcery is all about. Sword and Sorcery is really closer to horror. Um, it's not a magical world. Uh, the supernatural elements in in Conan's world, they're intrusive elements. You know, they don't belong. They're, it's more like a horror movie where the supernatural elements don't belong there, and you're trying to, you know, uh, get it out. They're unnatural. Um, and so if you really think of sword and sorcery, real pulp sword and sorcery, uh, as a mix between um, the adventure story of an Edgar Rice Burroughs and the sort of mythos type horror of H.P. Lovecraft, that's really what Howard stories are more like. So how is, when you translate that into a role-playing game, how is the role-playing game going to be different from, I don't know, Dungeons and Dragons or some of the previous games? Well, an, an obvious difference is going to be the magic system um, because, you know, magic is very different. Uh, you know, like I said, it's, it's low fantasy. It's the high fantasy that you, you get in most Dungeons and Dragons settings. Um, or other fantasy role-playing settings where you're shooting magic missiles and fireballs everywhere. Uh, magic in uh, the original Hyborian Age is a very dark, uh, unnatural process. Um, it's, you know, it, it's very um, corrupting to people who use it. Uh, it's, it's, you know, and so that's, that's difficult to translate into a game, especially for gamers that are used to having a lot of magic that they can use. Um, you find in the Conan stories, even when he does have sorcerers and, and magic using characters, a lot of times really what they're doing is alchemy or you know, mesmerism, that sort of thing, rather than true sorcery. When there is true sorcery, it's you know, very rare, very powerful, very dark. Uh, you know, usually you have to you know, sacrifice people and you know, scroll with blood on the, like the skin of a you know, human slave or something in order to, you know, create this magic thing that really may not even do a whole lot. Uh, and then you're drained afterwards forever and you've probably corrupted yourself and you've had to, you know, sell your soul to some outer dark, you know, you know, elder god or something in order to make it happen. So it's, it's very different and that's difficult to translate into a game, but we found ways to do it. Um, you know, characters can, you know, create some of the same effects that you would get in another game where, you know, it might be magic, you can you can do that with alchemy. You can do it with you know other things like that, um, Alchemedes type science tricks, those sorts of things. Uh, so there's ways to do it. There's ways to you know still have a character that is something like a sorcerer, um, you know, but without the the full blown you know high fantasy magic of a Dungeons and Dragons. Can you tell us about some of the writers that are working on the project and maybe why they were selected and how you're working with them? Sure. Well, uh, Jason Dural, of course, uh, is one of the primary writers, and uh, he's the lead designer for the game. Uh, you know, he's got a ton of experience. He's coming off of uh, you know, working on Akron uh, Cthulhu right now. Um, that's been a, a big project. Uh, Chris Lights is another writer. He's the one that actually got me involved in the project. Mark Finn, um, who is the primary uh, biographer of Howard. He's also another Robert E. Howard expert and a fiction writer and a gamer himself. Uh, so we brought him in uh, to do some writing. Um, Tim Brown, uh, who uh, was one of the creators of the Dark Sun uh, setting, the Dungeons and Dragons back in the day, which was Dungeons and Dragons trying to get back to a sword and sorcery feel after having several years of doing a lot of high, high fantasy type settings like Dragonlance. You know, they wanted to get back into a, a, a you know, a, a sort of a darker, low magic setting with Dark Sun. Uh, so Tim Brown, one of the creators of that, uh, is on board. So he's really perfect for this, uh, for what we're trying to do. He gets it. He understands what we're trying to do with this game. So, 
Uh, and those are just just a few. There's there's a lot of great writers that are attached to this project. And tell us, going back in history again, I guess. Um, I mean, I think we're probably most familiar with the look of Conan coming maybe from the Frazetta covers of the 1960s. But was there an image of Conan, a visual image of Conan uh, in the original writings? And then how has that changed over time? Um, they were. It's actually, um, it's really funny, actually, if you look back at some of the original pulp illustrations of Conan, um, some of the pulp covers, they were they were very different. Um, he would often have shorter hair. They would sometimes give him sort of a Roman look, uh, which was really interesting. And uh, Howard in his letters even commented, you know, on the art. Uh, he loved the, the Weird Tales covers by Margaret Brundage. Um, she was a, a famous uh, cover artist for the pulps, um, and in particular Weird Tales. And, uh, but there was another artist that he didn't particularly care for. He thought uh, that he made uh, Conan look a little bit too Roman. Uh, and so we actually have some letters, you know, where Howard talks about you know, the, uh, the artists in his day. Um, after that, you see that the same thing in the 50s. Um, Conan's often depicted almost in more of a sword and sandal, you know, Greco-Roman kind of style. Um, there's a few illustrations in the 50s where he's starting to get that barbarian kind of look, you know, that, that we know, you know, that we're sort of familiar with. But you're right, it was really Frank Frazetta who defined that look, uh, that, that primal barbarian look. Uh, and in fact, that first Frazetta uh, cover um, came out in 1966. So this year is actually the 50th anniversary uh, of uh, that first Frazetta Conan painting and that first merging of Robert E. Howard and Frank Frazetta, which is just one of those great artists and writer pairings that you sometimes get, you know, in history, like in N.C. Wyeth illustrating some of the great adventure stories or John Allen St. John with the Edgar Rice Burroughs cover. Rosetta and Robert E. Howard, they really are just the perfect match of prose and, and uh, you know, the visual arts, where they're, they're just something greater than the sum of their parts, you know, with the two of them together. Um, and so, you know, Rosetta, Rosetta has really defined the look of the character uh, to some degree. And, you know, some people might quibble a little bit, but, you know, it's pretty close, I think, to what Howard would. I think Howard would have loved Frank Rosetta's art. I can't imagine that he wouldn't. So how do you take all of these different types of art and like, so what's the approach to the art for the, for the role playing game project? Well, we decided early on, you know, you know, one of the ideas about this game is that we want it to be faithful to Robert E. Howard. You know, there's been a lot of, uh, a lot of authors, writers, creators that have added a number of pastiche stories and, uh, you know, comics and a lot of other material to the franchise over the years. Um, including in the previous role-playing games. And so we wanted to strip all of that away uh, and get back to the base character. And one of the ways we wanted to do that was with the art itself. We're going to have uh, multiple books coming out. So we wanted to have each one of the, the covers of the main supplements to be a scene from uh, one of... Cut that. Uh, to be a scene from one of the uh, stories, the original Robert E. Howard stories. And so that's sort of how we, we first started approaching the art, looking at the, the covers that we, get, we were going to be doing. And so then we wanted to go out and get some, you know, well-known Conan artists with, so that we could have a cover. Each cover would be by a name artist, you know, that, that Conan fans and Howard fans are familiar with. So we went out and we got Braum and we got San Julian and Mark Schultz, uh, uh, who illustrated one of the Conan volumes. Uh, we got Tom Grindberg, uh, Val Merrick, um, you know, a number of these uh, artists that uh, did work for, for Dark Horse, that did work for Marvel. We got uh, Tim Truman, who, you know, he's just great. I can't say enough great things about Tim Truman. Uh, he's writes uh, for Dark Horse, Dark Horse Conan series, but of course he's also an artist. He's one of the creators of Grimjack. That's what a lot of people know him for. But he is a Howard expert. He knows this material as well as I do. So working with Tim has just been a pleasure. He doesn't need much art direction. Uh, Tomas Giarello, who's just been a, a absolutely outstanding breakout artist for Dark Horse and the Dark Horse Conan series, a huge favorite of the fans. So we've gone out and got just top-notch artists, uh, people that the fans love. We've got newer artists. Uh, Simon Bisley is going to be doing a cover for us. Um, you know, so it's not just standard RPG artists, you know, but uh, you know some of the best you know illustrators out there in the game and people that know the source material and they get it. Uh, and so they're bringing Howard's Conan to life. 
Um, I can tell you some of these artists like Mark Schultz, some of them even were a little reluctant to get involved in this project until they heard what we were doing, until they heard that we were going to be faithful to Howard's version of Conan. And that's why they wanted to get involved in this project and, and were excited to get involved in it. If some people have come, I think probably, I guess, since the time of the movies, so probably for people, you know, their 20s and 30s, the principal introduction to the character probably has come through the Dark Horse comics. Um, tell, what do you, tell me what you think about those and, and how, if any way, that, that, you know, people who were introduced to the character from those, how they're going to see this, uh, this, this game. You know, I think the Dark Horse comics are great. I think Dark Horse has done an excellent job. Um, you know, I, I know several of, the, several of the creators that work for Dark Horse, um, you know, and I correspond with some of, some of the others. I, you know, they are you know, absolutely fans of the original stories. They were trying to capture that feel. I think uh, Kurt, Kurt Busiak, the first writer in the series, he did a great job. Um, Tim Trittman, who I just mentioned before, took over for Kurt. And is you know he's doing an amazing job. Uh, you know he's doing the uh, King Conan line uh, right now. Uh, Fred Van Lente has recently taken over the monthly series. Uh, also an excellent writer. Um, Dark Horse has really done an outstanding job with the with the license and with the characters. Um, so uh, yeah, I can't say enough good things about about Dark Horse. They, you know, they've done a few things here and there that you know weren't my favorite, but for the most part, you know they've been spot on. So I think that. Anyone that's you know coming to this as a fan of the Dark Horse comics, they're going to love this. This is a, this game is going to be made for them. You know. Now, what about? I mean, I know it probably wasn't close to what Howard was doing, but Conan the film, Conan the Barbarian, is one of the best realized fantasy films, sword and sorcery films, kind of ever. Dino De Laurentiis went all out in the production. The magic is super creepy. It's got James Earl Jones in it. The the perfect beginning story of the kid who watches his parents get killed by riding bandits, you know, and has to have uh, revenge. What? How does that fit into the whole into the whole milieu? It's whatever? it's not a very good adaptation of Howard's character, but it's a great movie in its own right. It is, it's an outstanding sword and sorcery movie. Um, probably one of the best ever. Uh, you know, it's, it's hard to talk. I you know I love it. It's, you know, it, it's not really, doesn't really have the feel of Howard's character, especially the characterization. You know, um, you know, Howard's Conan is smart, he's intelligent, he speaks a number of languages, you know, and that's, you don't get that with, with uh, Arnold's conception of the character. Arnold's, you know, he's you know, maybe not so bright, you know, that, that sort of created the, the big dumb oaf barbarian trope a little bit. Um, that's not really Howard's character. Jason Momoa in the more recent 2011 Conan it was actually a much better Conan, although the movie, you know, you know I'll, I'll try to be try to be polite here, eh, you know, not so much, you know. Uh, so I think Conan the Barbarian, nineteen eighty two, is a much better film. I think the more recent uh, two thousand eleven Conan, Jason Momoa's version of the character was a was a much better version of the character. Okay. Well, it sounds like there'll be something in there for like people who like any of those Conan products. And I guess I'm also thinking that there might be some people who haven't played a role-playing game before who might be interested in it just because it's this great collection of artists and, and writers, etc. Oh, I know. I, I, I know people that have already told me that they aren't gamers, but when they've heard the art lineup, they're collectors, they're fans of the material, they're going to be buying this just for the art. Um, I hope that some of, this, some of them will actually crack the books and, and give it a try because... I think they're going to find that they really enjoy it. Um, you know, we, we first got a chance to uh, play test this game uh, last year in Robert E. Howard's hometown uh, in Cross Plains, Texas, where he's from. Uh, every year we have a celebration there, uh, Robert E. Howard Days in June. And uh, last year we had a chance to play test one of the early beta versions of the game. And we played it in Robert E. Howard's house at his dining room table. And that was just an amazing experience. And I think for a lot of those hardcore Howard fans, even that weren't gamers, they saw this going on and they were really curious about it and, you know, wanting to, you know, see what this was all about. Uh, so I'm hoping, you know, this year we can have Howard days again and there'll be, we'll have a lot of gaming going on there. And so I'm hoping this will get some new, new people attracted to role playing itself. Uh, people that might not have done it otherwise, but they are interested in this character. Um, so I'm hoping it will bring some new people in. I'm sure it will. 
It's good you bring that up because we actually have a clip of you guys playing at the table. Um, so let's take a look at that. Dude, We're here at Robert E. Howard's living room. Yeah. yeah. Playing a con <laughs> yeah. playing game. It doesn't, it doesn't get any cooler. Yeah. It doesn't it really uh, is. As of right now, all you have on is a twist of loincloth. You have no weapons, uh, no nothing. But at your feet lie yeah. one pair of chains, which the... Uh, which the helper has not yet picked up. He has a basket full of the rest of your irons. Okay. All right. Are there any torches? Uh, it is, uh, the sun is setting, okay. no torches yet, uh, but there will be torches uh, coming out as, uh, as the pit darkens. Okay. And, and these guys are all working? Those, no, they, no, it's the end of the day. The, the table over here is where you're going to get your uh, cup of gruel yeah. and okay. crust of bread. So they're all loose, but... but yeah, but. they're about to, yes. Okay. So at this point, you have two avenues available to you, all right? Uh, the pit walls are pretty sheer, uh, but right here is access. And if you can get to the top here... Uh, you can uh, perhaps liberate yourselves. However, uh, they're watching you. you. All eyes are on you. So if you make a move, you need to make a bold move. Forget this. I'd rather die than be a slave, you coffee and dog. <laughs> yes! <laughs> I'm going to grab the chains to my feet and swing it at that dude right there. And That's standard. The guy with the basket. I'm going to change I'm, so gonna, gonna, I'm, I'm buying an extra. Uh, attack, okay. okay. I'm buying an extra D20. I'm I'm gonna gonna throw, gonna throw, throw a thread in there. Much. That was quick. Cool. All right. All right. So what, what do we got here? I got the. All right. So my melee combat is a 10. Yes. So I got one success. All right, one success is enough to hit him. Okay. Uh, so with the chain, uh, chains do um, one plus three dice. Okay, one plus three dice. Yep, one okay. plus three CDs. Was this the guy with the, um, which one had the basket? The basket is uh, the guy, yeah. Guy. yeah. Okay. So you're gotcha. swinging across. Okay, so it did one point. One point of damage. Uh, okay. Which is fine. That's, that's going to be enough to at least get him to... Uh, Look well, very surprised. <laughs> he holds on to the die. He holds on to the basket. In the face. Uh, but, but he is he's staggered. So well, I see that he's starting to stagger. Right. And so I will um, take a swing at him with my legs to try and cause him to fall down. I like as long as he's already grab the basket. As long as he's already <laughs> falling backwards. All right. I'm not sure if I need to try an extra dice, but I only have an eleven, so that's not quite. That's 50% chance yeah, of this, yeah. this is important. Okay. So I'm going to give him another threat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, yeah. the downside is, is then it increases his ability to like do, do other bad thing. stuff to us. All right, so here we go. Let's do it. A 10, and one, and a two, two successes. and a 14. All right. So you got a momentum, too. Probably. Yes, which means the basket goes flying. And um, so what do you want? Where, where does the basket land, Todd? It lands. <laughs> Where I can grab a chain. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to let you grab a chain on the way down. The basket right. spills out in front spills of you. You grab one out of the air. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then cause it to, to fling it over here amongst the rest of the people. Roll so. your roll damage for the tackle. Yeah. Uh, and actually, for the tackle, you're going to roll. What's your. Um, Come on, one. You can use momentum for, right. like, if you can't think of something cool, you can use it to do extra damage. Right. Right. Momentum is because I want the basket kind of to thing. fall within the reach of the rest of yeah. the guys. Yeah. You yeah. can't That's, think of something cool, you know. Yeah. Uh, so the good news is, is he is down, and uh, the man who has struck your manacles uh, screams, yeah. Guards! They're escaping! <laughs> I would like to grab a, a manacle and then begin to use one of my abilities to persuade our yeah, slave. Oh, yeah. yeah. Grab the chain and, free and, and turn around. Yeah. Okay, which is, that's what I would like to do. Perfect. All right, so, and then I'm going to try persuade here. Fellow slaves, it is our chance for freedom. Follow us. Be cannon fodder. I have smart <laughs> Not the last part, but... Uh, <laughs> So having played the game, what were your thoughts? And well, tell us, have you played a lot of role-playing games before? And then what were your thoughts about this game and how it was different if in, in any way? I started playing, uh, I think I started playing Dungeons and Dragons with the red basic box set uh, when I was probably nine years old, you know, in, uh, you know, nine or 10 years old in fourth grade uh, back in 1980 or so, 79, 80, I guess 80. Um, you know, so I've, I've been gaming for a long time. Um, Mostly Dungeons and Dragons, but also Call of Cthulhu. You know, I've played a number number of different games over the years. But 
you know, I've been a D&D guy for, you know, you know, most of my life. Um, you know, this game is, uh, it's much more like some of the more modern games where it's less crunchy, more narrative driven. You know, that's really the way it needs to be. And, you know, I'm a guy, I don't really mind crunch. I, you know, I, I played my share of 3.5. I was, you know, that, that, that was my thing. And, and the old Mongoose Conan game was a very good uh, D20 game. It really was a very good D20 game. But, uh, you know, today, you know, we're, we're really trying to get back to a, a faster pace, uh, you know, more action-oriented, uh, you know, narrative, story-driven game. And uh, that's, I think, what, uh, what this game is going to do. That's what it feels like so far with the, with the testing. It's fast. The combat is brutal. Um, I didn't last long. I got gigged in the back with a spear, you know, and I was done. Uh, you know, it, it's but it's fun. It's it's very fast paced. Uh, you know, I like it. Uh, you know, there was there it, there were a few mechanics early on that I, I wasn't sure about. You know, I was a little dubious, and uh, but then we started once once we started playing. I'm like, okay, yeah, that works. That's fun. This is cool. Um, so it's a lot of fun. It's a fun game, and you know the right approach is being taken with it. I think um, you know even in the the design of the supplements that we're going to be doing, it's taking into account this idea of the narrative and that we're going back to the stories. You know, I mentioned that a lot of the original stories, you know, this one this one might have Conan as a pirate, and so the story will have all the tropes of a of a pulp pirate story. This one has him as a thief, so it's more of a thief keeper type. Story. So each one of these stories has a kind of a different feel to it. We're trying to do that too with the supplements with this game. So the pirate supplement, it, it's not just you know here's all the different types of ships, here's the naval combat rules, you know here's all the the ports and the, a map and everything. It's how do you play uh, this Conan game so that it feels like you're in one of these Conan pirate stories, you know. How does it capture the essence of those stories? Um, if it's a thief game, it's not just, you know, here's the setting, here's some thieves rules or whatever, some special characters. How do you play your this this game, this game session, like one of the thief stories, like like one of the Conan thief stories? How does it have that feel? What tropes does it use? You know, uh, you know, giving advice for the game master to, you know, to make it feel like you're actually immersed in one of these old 1930s pulp adventure stories. That's what the game really tries to do, and I think it's very effective. I, you know, it's it's uh, and, and kind of unique in that sense. Trying trying to do that, um, so I think that's one of the things that makes this game special. Yeah, I think it reminds me a little bit of. I mean, as opposed to, you know, if I get if I buy into into some game systems, they'll just be like every couple months there'll be a new splat book that comes out that explains this other area. This seems to be more akin to like the way uh, Final Fantasy or I always get that wrong. Fantasy Flight Games is releasing Star Wars in three different kind of games where the first one is about, uh, you know, scoundrels and the second one is about, you know, the Alliance and the third one is about, you know, uh, Jedi, etc. So that it's more of maybe helps the game master in terms of helping them with the, with the thematic uh, direction of their campaigns. Yeah, setting the tone for the game, exactly. Um, you know, I, I think Jason had a great description. Uh, Jason Dural, you know, who's the uh, the designer, he you know he's also a big fan. He knows the stories very well. And you know, I was trying to explain this in terms of you know different genre stories. You know, here's the you know the Crusader story, the thief story. Jason uh, made a great observation. And I love I love this analogy. He said, you know, the original Conan stories. It's almost like being in the back of one of the movie lots in the 1930s or 40s and hopping from set to set. You know, like here's the, you know, here's the, uh, the Errol Flynn pirate set over here. Here's the, you know, whatever. This is the, you know, the, the Robin Hood set here. This is, you know, it, it's like that. It's hopping from different set, movie set to movie set, like backstage, you know, the back lots of the, of the, the studio. And, you know, that's, that's sort of what we're trying to do with, with these different supplements. You know, if you remember the old Lancer books, those of you that are old enough to remember those, or the Ace paperbacks. You would have, you know, Conan, Conan the, the Buccaneer, Conan the Warrior, Conan the Adventurer. So we're, we're kind of um, following that idea, all of these different career gigs that Conan have. We're using that sort of as a framing device for the supplement. So you're going to have the Thief book, the Bandit book, the Mercenary book, the King book, you know, when he becomes king, uh, the Pirate book, of course. So, you know, these will be, uh, we're going to use those career paths that Conan had um, as the framing device 
uh, to set the stage for these supplements, to give you, you know, these different types of games that you can play, different types of sessions that you can have, different themes, as you said, different thematic uh, you know, ideas you know, for the games. Okay, and then I, you know, going beyond just the books, um, what's the overall artistic vision of the project? Because I know that there are props and things like that that are are, are involved in this. They're part of the Kickstarter. Uh, we're gonna have some um, leather bound versions of the books, deluxe versions of the books. They're working on some stone dice, things like that, um, which look really cool. Uh, you know, there's lots of little props and things like that. I don't want to give away everything because some of this, you know, will be uh, you know, revealed during the Kickstarter, but. You know, there's going to be lots of lots of different things like that. Lots of little special items uh, that are be coming up. Um, you know, I, I think a special kind of map they're doing. Um, so I don't want to give away too much, but there's going to be some cool stuff for this game. I'm looking forward to it. I think my number one request would be a, fla- a metal flagon with my name on it. That would be as a stretch goal. <laughs> That's a good idea. <laughs> Well, Jeffrey, I'm sure that you've got a lot to do as uh, as Kickstarter, you know, rolls. So um, we'll let you go. But uh, thanks very much for telling us more about the artistic vision of the Conan role playing game. Thanks. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me.